All right, we're going to get started. Um, I'm Chris Knudsen. Uh, you've joined EMS Medicine Live. Uh, this is our October uh, 2015 talk. We've moved from apples and apple picking last month to pumpkins and Halloween now. Um, of course, just to review, this is uh, EMS Medicine Live's design for community and academic EMS physicians. Uh, try and review topics of interest and also board review topics uh, or current topics of interest. Uh, we do ask people to join live if they can. Uh, we found that live participation is uh, much more useful, uh, both for the presenter and for those folks watching. Um, just to touch on one thing from last month, uh, we did survey people when they wanted this to happen. Uh, we're gonna keep this Tuesday at one for the time being. I, I apologize, I didn't reach out to those interested fellowships um, over the last few weeks to see if a better time was uh, available. Though it seems like Tuesday at 11 and Tuesdays at one are probably the best time, so it works for us. Works for a majority of you, so we'll keep it at one for now. Uh, just so everyone knows they are muted at this point, except for Mike and myself. Um, if you want to message me, I'm on EMS Medicine Live as my alternate account. Uh, just message me there, and we'll try to ask either cue your questions for the end or uh, interrupt Mike and ask them if necessary. I am recording this. You're free to do so on your end as well. Uh, but this will be posted online. Uh, probably the best way to reach us, just Google EMS Medicine Live. We're the first two links that pop up. Uh, the first link is to our webpage, and the second is to our Facebook. Um, the uh, webpage does have the slides and the, the uh, video presentations. And of course, questions at the end. You, I'll unmute everyone for a free-for-all, and we'll see what happens. Um, I feel pretty fortunate to have uh, Mike Millen uh, from Johns Hopkins talking today. Uh, I've met Mike at the last few uh, NESP meetings uh, for the past two or three years. Uh, I know he's been passionate on this topic we're going to discuss today, uh, but he did his residency at uh, Michigan State, went to Oregon for his fellowship and got his MPH in the process. Now he's in Johns Hopkins uh, working down there. Um, he is the medical director of uh, BWI Fire and also their critical transport team. Uh, he's also act very active on the s &P committee for NASP. Um, and uh, very fortunate to have him today. So with that, I'm gonna hand off the conversation to him. I'm going to mute myself here and then give it over to Mike. Fantastic, thank you, Christian. Um, let's see, so everyone, this is my first foray into uh, web and ours. So hopefully I do this correctly as I try and advance the slides. There we go. Okay, uh, so again, my name is Michael Millen. Uh, I'm an emergency uh, EMS physician at Johns Hopkins. I'm medical director for the fire department at BWI Airport and the Hopkins Critical Care Transport Team. I'm also medical director for Maryland Search and Rescue, it's a wilderness search and rescue program in the state of Maryland. Um, I've been at Hopkins for about 13 years now. Uh, and very involved with SMP within EMSP, uh, and very interested in academic EMS medicine and bringing science to EMS medicine. What I'm talking about is backboards uh, in uh, the management of spinal cord trauma. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking about not just backboards themselves, but also about science in general and how we make decisions in science uh, in EMS uh, and medicine in general. Uh, so my topic centers around the question of utility of backboards, but I want you to think about my topic beyond that and science in general. So I want to start uh, by taking you back a few years, uh, and um, we're going to go way back to, whoop, to about uh, 600 BC. And I want you to imagine yourself as a scientist in 600 BC, and you have this concept in your mind that the world is a spherical uh, place. Uh, and you're being met with resistance as you're trying to tell people about that because of course the world is flat. And we know the world is flat because when I send out my boats to sea, they occasionally don't come back. And that means that of course if my boats don't come back when I send them out to sea, that's because they dropped off the edge of the world because the world is, of course, flat. 
And the level of evidence I have to prove that the world is flat is anecdotal evidence based on the fact that my ships don't come back uh, when I send them to sea. That's a really important concept uh, to think about that in science, uh, and the levels of evidence that we use to make decisions. And that's very relevant to this topic of backwards. So just uh, to put disclosures out there, uh, I have no financial disclosures uh, that are relevant to this topic. I do have intellectual disclosures. Uh, as was noted, uh, I'm very active with SP, with NEMSP, and I chaired uh, the SP committee when um, this came before committee. Uh, I was the senior author on the resource document um, that supported the NEMSP ACS COT position on uh, backwards and uh, trauma and spinal cord injury um, and helped shepherd uh, it through uh, our board. Um, and so um, intellectually, I'm very tied to this in many different ways because of the challenges that we had through that. I'm also the primary sponsor of a protocol for the state of Maryland uh, called the Spinal Protection Protocol that went into effect July of this year, 2015. Uh, and so that's also an intellectual um, way that I'm tied to this uh, topic. So we're going to talk about the science behind the use of backwards for spinal mobilization. We're going to talk about how we use uh, the research and uh, exploration of that science to develop evidence-based uh, protocols. And then we're going to talk specifically about the protocol we have in Maryland uh, as a backdrop uh, looking at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats as we go forward uh, with this topic uh, on a national basis. So uh, interestingly, I really think that everything we do in medicine, we really have to think about how are we benefiting our patients. Um, many people, when they graduate from medical school, uh, they say the Hippocratic Oath, uh, which loosely reads, with regards to my patients, I will do no harm or injustice. Um, we often will refer to that as, first, I will do no harm. When I graduated from medical school at Rush Medical College, we actually had to say the prayer of Maimonides which loosely uh, states, Almighty God, thou hast chosen me in thy mercy to watch over the life and death of thy creatures. So everything we do, we have to balance these uh, benefits and harms that we might cause to our patient. Um, and we should never be doing anything without thinking about that. Even a simple blood draw to look for a blood count has the potential to cause harm to our patient because we're sticking the patient with the needle. And so everything we do, we should always be thinking about how is what I'm about to do to my patient going to help them, balanced against what are the potential harms. And this is very relevant to the conversation of backwards, because the conversation of backwards isn't just about benefits, it's also about harms, as you will see as I go through the literature here. So there's a question of benefits and harms that we have to think about as we examine this question. Um, from a scientific basis, I try to approach all questions uh, from a PICO format. Uh, so we formulated a, a PICO question. The population is patients in the at a hospital or pre-hospital or EMS environment with a fractured spine or injury to the spinal cord or spinal column. Now note that when we look at this question, the population we're really interested in is not the population that clearly has neurological deficit. It's actually rather the population that has an injury to the spinal column but doesn't have a clinical deficit that we're able to find. That's really the population we're trying to hone in on as we examine this question. The intervention is inline stabilization with soft padding. The comparison group is what we've been doing for years, which is immobilization with a hard backboard. And our outcome is protecting the spinal cord itself from injury without causing harm to the patient. Now, there's some interesting history that I think is very important as we think about this. Um, from a radiological perspective, x-rays were developed in the early 1900s. CT scans were developed in the early 1970s, and MRIs were developed in the late 1970s, but it really wasn't until very recently that we had MRIs uh, so prevalent as they are today. At Johns Hopkins, we have a new emergency department we've been in for about three years now. We have an MRI machine in our emergency department. Um, that's probably pretty rare. Five years ago, we did not have an MRI in our emergency department. To get an MRI in my patient, I had to send them someplace else in the institution. 
when I was a resident at Michigan State to get an MRI, and we had to put the patient in an ambulance and drive them someplace else because we didn't have one at our hospital, which I think is probably the norm still today in many hospitals. This is important because what we really want to do is actually look at the spinal cord itself, uh, and to do that, we need an MRI. Now, from an EMS history perspective, this is also important. Accidental death and disability uh, was published in 1966, which led to the uh, passage of the EMS Act in 1973. Um, and then now we know that EMS is a board certification of uh, medicine. As I introduce myself, I'm not just an emergency physician. I am an EMS physician. I really think of myself as practicing EMS medicine. But of course, that's a new thing. That's very new that we have the practice of EMS medicine and physicians who are really focusing their careers on EMS medicine. In the history of medicine, that's very, very new. And that is also relevant to this conversation of backwards based on how the practice evolved and who it evolved from. Why is all this important? Well, much to their credit, uh, when there was no one else there to manage this injury, the group that really took the ball and ran with it was orthopedic surgeons. Uh, they took the ball with managing spinal cord injury and with EMS development uh, in the early stages. Our first EMS textbooks were published by orthopedic surgeons. And no fault of their own, they thought like orthopedic surgeons and still do. And, and that's okay. That's the way they're supposed to think. We know that if you break the tib fib, the best way to manage that in the field is to splint to the joint above and below the site of the injury. That's the best way to manage a tib-fib fracture in the field. Splint that, trying to immobilize those bones that are moving around to the, bone, the joint above and below the site of the injury. Well, if it works for a fracture of the lower leg, it must work for the fracture of the spinal column. If immobilization is the right thing to do for when you fracture the lower leg, immobilization must be the right thing to do when you fracture the cervical cord or cervical column. That is the basis of where we got to today, that hypothesis. And that's what it is. It's a hypothesis that was generated by a group of physicians who were the right physicians to manage this injury at the time, who were not EMS physicians, and were looking at this from the perspectives of the bones that support around the spinal cord because they did not have MRI and they did not have EMS medicine. And so we are now in a different place today that we have to look at this differently than we did then, but it's very hard for the scientific community to do that without and ignore everything that led up to today. When you look at the literature, the first thing that's published about the management of spinal cords is published in the 1940s. Um, this was uh, published by a group of orthopedic surgeons who were noticing injured soldiers being taken off the battlefield in World War II who ended up being paralyzed because their fellow soldiers picked them up from the arms and the legs and they effectively folded them in half. And if there was an injury to the spinal column, they were basically throwing that injury around. And so they were trying to find a way to safely get those soldiers off the battlefield. And so they developed what is known as the Clark Moore method, where you place a patient on a stretcher, which should be a hard, flat stretcher with padding below the cervical and lumbar spine. And the purpose is to avoid excessive extension and flexion, with a key word on excessive. It really was about moving the patient from point A to point B without disrupting things too much. That's what it was really all about initially. But it's also important to note that this publication was an editorial. There's no outcomes in here. There's not one patient that's discussed. This is an editorial, a hypothesis that's thrown into the literature. Now, the first outcomes that we find was published by Rogers in 1957. Uh, he looked at 77 patients with cervical cord injury. Eight of those patients, he identified that their neurological deficits developed after the point of injury. So these were patients that he followed up in his orthopedic clinic 
and he wrote about them. And they were all patients who had neurological deficits that were followed up in his orthopedic clinic after car crashes. Eight of those patients, by getting the history from the patient, he figured that the patient's neurological deficits developed a day, a few hours, sometime after the initial point of injury. And so he determined they had delayed onset of neurological symptoms. Of course, this is all conjecture based on getting a history from the patient, which is, of course, biased. Interestingly, all eight patients had anterior fracture dislocations. And he proposed that if those patients had been put in his special collar, which you can see a picture of here, at the time of injury, they would not have developed delayed neurological symptoms. And you can see the idea of his collar was to create traction. So he has these stays on the collar that you twist to try and elongate to create traction, as if you were splinting a mid-shaft femur fracture. Now, of course, he has no proprietary interest in selling this collar. Uh, he's just tossing this out as, you know, they should have been put in this collar that I designed uh, because it would have prevented uh, their injury. He has no way to know that for sure, um, but that's what he writes. Now, after Rogers, we find Geisler. He publishes in 1966. He has a similar type of study. These are patients that he also followed up in clinic uh, who had delayed onset of uh, symptoms. There were a total of 958 patients in the study that had the spinal cord injuries. Um, so it starts out as this very large cohorted study. However, he only just talks about 29 patients um, who have no spinal in, or neurological deficit initially and then de develop delayed neurological deficit. Again, this is noted based on a history of the patient. However, he only actually gives us any information about two patients. The pa first patient was in a car crash in 1949. He was initially a mobile, or mobile. Six hours later, he presents to a hospital with inability to walk. He has six months of rehab, and he regains the ability to walk. So this patient has delayed onset of symptoms of some sort. However, he does not have permanent paralysis. Patient number two was in a car crash in 1955, and it's important to note as well that all these early studies were in automobiles before we have they are designed today and again before EMS as it is today. So this patient was in a car crash in 1955. He had shock and a depressed skull fracture. He was, as noted in nursing notes, observed to move all four limbs. There is no formal neurological exam noted in here, and certainly this patient had some sort of mental status changes as he had depressed skull fracture. If nothing else, he had to have had a GCS less than 15. Um, 48 hours post-injury, the patient develops par paraplegia at T10. He goes to a decompressive laminectomy, which we show in literature from the 1970s to actually be harmful. And the patient's noted to then have permanent paralysis at the level of T4. Dr. Geisler writes, this man would surely have been protected from the paraplegic condition had the spinal instability been recognized and precautions taken. And then he writes, the importance of a proper first aid was deduced from the fact that 29 patients developed further paralysis through faulty handling. Dr. Geisler and Dr. Rogers put into the literature a proposed hypothesis. The proposed hypothesis is that if you have a patient with a fracture of the spinal column, but they don't have neurological injury. The spinal cord itself is not injured, but the column is. And you move those fractures of the column around, that that movement will cause neurological deficits. That's the hypothesis they put into the literature. And it's a very interesting hypothesis, but that's what it is. It is a hypothesis. Now you have three other articles that are often referenced by people who argue that we should continue to use backwards. These are Casas, Coffis, and Farrington, also published in the mid-1960s. These three articles are all about how to immobilize. They have these great pictures like I show here where they drag a patient out of a car with ropes and pulleys and winches onto boards, um, but there's no patient outcome data in here. It's just about how to do the technique because by then it's assumed that you should be doing this technique. 
Now we all know that once you read something published in a textbook, it is now standard of care. I just, uh, it, as of interest of those who are interested in history, uh, this is a copy that I have of what is often known as the Orange Book. Um, when I was a fellow, I was really interested in um, the development of our practice of EMS medicine. And so through the Library of Medicine, they actually got a copy of the Orange Book, uh, which I then later used um, when we were developing uh, our work. So we read in the Orange Book, carefully splint the injured spine, avoiding abnormal or excessive motion. Be sure that the injured person is properly splinted and transported on a long backboard or special stretcher without bending or twisting the spine in any direction. In 1971, we determined that the proper way to manage this patient was to put them on a backboard. We established that standard of care for a patient with blunt trauma, with concern for possible spinal cord injury, was backboarding. With a level of evidence of hypothesis. We have no stronger evidence that created this practice than evidence that reaches the level of hypothesis generation, very similar to the level of evidence that created the idea that the world is flat. Now, due to the controversy of this over the past 10 to 15 years, the Cochrane Review decided to take a look at this question. And their question was, does backboards cause harm to patients and is there a benefit? And we read in the Cochrane Review, the effect of pre-hospital spinal mobilization on mortality, neurological injury, and spinal instability remains uncertain. The possibility of the mobilization may increase mortality and morbidity cannot be excluded. So the Cochrane Review, in their great way, couldn't answer the question for us, really because the level of evidence needed to get into the Cochrane Review to answer the question isn't there. Either direction, there isn't level of evidence in the literature to be able to determine quite clearly the benefit of backboards. Yet despite that, the Cochrane Review did something for us that was very helpful, and they presented 18 articles on simulated patients that they felt were very important to this conversation. And what these 18 articles show is that the more you strap, the more you immobilize. Now that is actually a self-fulfilling prof prophecy in that if I put a patient on a flat service and I dump a ton of bricks on them, they of course are not going to move. So we quite clearly know that we can keep a patient from moving if we strap them hard enough to a board. But we also know that the stronger you strap, the more you cause complications. Most importantly, as you'll see in a minute, the inability to breathe. I can strap a patient to a board so strong that they will never breathe. And that is a problem. So what do we know about the bad of backboards? Well, the first thing we all know is backboards cause pain. Now, frankly, if that's all it was, we'd probably be able to say that the harm of backboards may be outweighed by a benefit. Because there are definitely times we do things to our patients that cause pain. And when we do that, we do that because we really feel that there's a greater benefit than the harm of the pain. But it's real. That pain of a backboard is real, and it's something that we should ignore. We also know that backboards cause pressure sores, and this is clearly shown in the peer-reviewed literature. But one of the things that we will often hear is that, well, that only happens when you put a patient on a backboard for a long period of time. So as long as you roll them off quickly, that's not a problem. And I want to hold on to that, that thought. We're going to come back to that comment in a little bit here um, because I'm going to challenge that. We also know that backboards cause unnecessary radiological testing, uh, which in a pediatric population we know over time increases the, the lifetime risk of cancer. Uh, and so this is not a small thing uh, to be causing x-rays to people who do not need them. And finally, we know that backboards cause respiratory compromise, and I'm going to go into this literature a little bit more, because this is interesting in that these patients, again, all these studies are actually in simulated patients. In a simulated study, we know that backboards decrease the ability to breathe. Well, if it causes the inability to breathe for a simulated patient, it's got to be causing difficulty breathing for a patient with multi-system trauma. 
And I don't know about you all, but where I train, B generally becomes before D, and I'm frankly more concerned about a patient with pulmonary contusions than I am about the patient's spinal column, because that's gonna kill them first. And so we are truly causing a harm to the multi-system trauma patient when we put them on a backboard and we decrease their respiratory capacity. So again, these are her studies that were in simulated, the two I'm gonna show you. Um, the first, and I apologize for the formatting error in my box there, that's a Mac uh, to PC issue. Uh, this was done in 15 healthy non-smoking volunteer males. All were strapped to a board. They were testing uh, their pulmonary functioning tests three different ways, the patient standing, the patient um, uh, lying down flat, and then the patient uh, strapped to a board. And we show uh, the FVC decreases dramatically and FVV1 decreases dramatically um, when you put the patient on a backboard. This very same kind of study was repeated in a pediatric population and showed the same exact thing, uh, that FVC decreases dramatically when you put a patient onto a backboard. So we show in the peer-reviewed literature um, that uh, with backboards in a simulated patient, you decrease uh, respiratory capacity, which then you could easily extrapolate to a multi-system trauma patient with concern for pulmonary contusions and know that you are causing harm to your patient. Now, when I brought this topic to the state of Maryland, uh, one of the criticisms what, that I got was, well, we want a stronger level of evidence, so what we want you to do is a double randomized controlled trial to test out your hypothesis that backwards are causing more harm than benefit. That's a really challenging study to do, and as a scientist, I would be happy to tell you that I would love to do that study. To do that study right, what you have to do actually is you have to find patients who you have identified spinal column injury. You have to then be able to say the patients that were put on a backboard and the patients who were not put on a backboard and to be able to compare over time those that had neurological deficits and those that didn't have neurological deficits, those that developed harms and those that didn't develop harms. That's a study that would need tens of thousands of patients to get to a couple hundred of patients with actual spinal cord injury, or spinal column injury, excuse me. That's a nearly impossible study to do, and it would take a lot to get there. And, and that's why that study is not in the literature. Uh, so for my academic colleagues out there, I challenge you to do that study. That would add a lot. But until then, we have to use what we have and go forward. And so the one study we have that has any outcomes comparing two different groups is a study published by Dr. Hoswell. The study is uh, criticized quite a bit because you're not comparing apples and apples. What Dr. Hoswell did is he looked at patients uh, who were uh, blunt trauma patients in Malaysia, compared them to patients who were blunt trauma patients in New Mexico. Those who were in New Mexico were put on backboards. Those who were um, in Malaysia were not put on backboards. He looked at injury severity scores to try and identify patients who were equally traumatized. And then he looked at the last uh, hospital note for the patient to identify evidence of neurological injury. What Dr. Hoswell showed was that those patients who were put on a backboard had an increased risk of developing neurological disability. Whoa, that is dramatic. Basically, this study shows that backboards themselves could be causing neurological disability. Now, again, this study is often criticized because it doesn't compare apples and apples. You're looking at two different EMS systems. You're actually not looking at real neurological good outcomes. And all that is true. And I'll tell you, as someone who has published a couple articles here and there, no article is perfect. And this study itself is not perfect either. But what this study does for us is it puts a different hypothesis in the literature. It proposes a counter hypothesis that perhaps, just perhaps, delayed neurological injury has nothing whatsoever to do with movement. That maybe there is some other process going on. 
That's what this study does. It puts a counter hypothesis into the literature, and that is very important. Now, this is actually a really good outcome study uh, that looks at patients in the National Trauma Data Bank. Uh, and this was published by my colleague, Dr. Elliot Hout uh, at Hopkins. He's one of the trauma surgeons that I get the pleasure to work with on a regular basis. And he looked at patients with penetrating trauma uh, who were put on backboards uh, in the spinal or in the National Trauma Data Bank and compared those with penetrating trauma who were not put on backboards. And with his studies, he showed that patients who were put on a backboard uh, had a almost two times risk of death, mortality. Now, his study was not powered to answer the question why. He writes uh, that he's, his hypothesis of why is that the, placing the patient on the backboard is increasing their out-of-hospital time, and that is what's leading to the increased mortality. But again, he's actually not able to show why, but clearly he is able to show that patients with penetrating trauma should not be put on backboards um, because there is definitely an increased risk, not just neurological disability, but death. So when we look at uh, this from a biomechanical perspective, uh, we want to know what's going on with this patient and what are the forces needed, therefore, to cause injury to the spine would be a question to ask. And so there's a couple articles that have looked at this uh, that are really interesting looking at cadavers. Uh, and this one I give you here, what they did is they um, looked at um, the forces needed to create injury to the spinal column when you keep the whole cadaver intact, and when you uh, dissect the spinal column outside of the cadaver. And what they showed was it creates, it needs about 600 to 7,000 newtons of force to create an actual injury to the spinal column. That's a lot of force. So a little more recently, in 2013, Dr. Hoswell published another study um, in the uh, literature, uh, which is really an interesting read. The study has no outcomes data in it. It reads very much like an editorial. Um, and what he talks about is the forces applied to the cadavers and the forces applied by gravity. And he mentions that gravity is about 10 newtons of force. And the force required to injure the spinal column, again, is 600 to 7,000 newtons of force. So the force of gravity is 10 newtons of force, and it takes about 600 newtons of force at a minimum to create injury to the spinal column. What are the chances that if you have a trained EMS provider who picks up the patient, and there's a little bit of movement of the spinal column just because of gravity, that little bit of movement is actually going to cause harm. What are the chances of that? And Dr. Hoswell basically argues that the chances are really low. And perhaps there is something else going on. And what Dr. Hoswell proposes is that perhaps, just perhaps, that maybe what's actually going on is the same thing that goes on with every other tissue that gets injured over time, which is swelling and edema. Now, one of the things I like to do in my free time, I'm an avid uh, outdoorsman. I do a lot of mountain biking, uh, rock climbing, skiing, hiking, etc. And a couple years ago, I was doing some mountain biking at a park near me, and I went over a jump and did not land the jump very well, unfortunately, and took all the force into my left shoulder. And right away, uh, I got up. I was fine. I wasn't concussed. I always wear a helmet, and I could do this no problem. About... Two, three hours later, certainly six hours later, I could do about that. I could just barely move my shoulder. The initial point of injury, no big deal. Six, 12 hours later, lots of swelling and edema, inflammation, and I could hardly move my shoulder. And because I'm an athlete, I know how to rehab. Six to nine months of rehab, my shoulder's now back to totally normal. Two years later, I'm now mountain biking again. Swelling and edema. Spinal column is, spinal cord is made up of neuroclastic tissue. It is not made of osteoclastic tissue. It is not bone. It is neurological tissue. 
And it's going to act much more like soft tissue and like ligamentous tissue than it is going to act like bone. And Dr. Hoswell suggests that perhaps what's actually going on when the cord gets delayed neurological findings later on with the patient is swelling and edema of the cord, which is then causing compressions of nerves, and these little tiny neurons are edematous and not working very well. And perhaps that's actually what's going on. Now, again, there's no outcomes. There's no real hard data. This is a counter hypothesis in the literature. Now, one of the things that's actually also interesting that's evolved recently on the biomechanics is, again, this idea of movement and how much movement does it actually take to injure something. So let's say movement is a problem. How much movement is needed? And what are the types of movement that are needed? And so there's a group of researchers out of Ireland uh, that I've had the pleasure of speaking with at last year's NEMSP meeting who've done a couple article, uh, studies looking at this. One of them, I actually, I believe, was recently published, and I apologize they don't have that reference up here for you. Uh, what they've done is they've looked at patients who are put in cars, and they put biomarkers uh, on them, and with laser beams, they watch these biomarkers to see how much movement uh, of the body itself when someone moves around getting themselves out of a car. And what they've shown is that when the patient stands themselves out of a car, they actually move the neck less than when EMS providers try and move the patient out of a car. And so their studies are showing uh, this concept um, that perhaps the patient actually is likely to move themselves around less when they self-splint than when an EMS provider picks them up out of the car. So biomechanically, we are showing in the literature that self-splinting by a patient is probably more effective at minimizing movement um, than EMS providers moving the patient. We show that it takes a lot more force to gra than gravity uh, to actually injure the cord. And we have this counter hypothesis that perhaps swelling edema is actually uh, the cause of delayed neurological findings and not movement itself. So in the 1970s, uh, a bunch of physicians came up with this idea that we need to immobilize. We need to immobilize the spinal column. Now we have this concept that's being proposed in the literature of spinal motion restriction. And spinal motion restriction is actually also about movement. It's about the idea that movement is the cause of delayed neurological findings. But I would tell you that when you look at the literature, the level of evidence that movement is the cause is still only at the level of hypothesis generation. And it actually doesn't get at what's really important. I actually don't care if the bones move. I care that the cord itself doesn't get injured and that my patient doesn't become paralyzed. That's what I care about. Now, when I teach a resident how to put a central line in, and I teach uh, my favorite technique is a supraclavicular technique, and residents often say to me, so how do you know that you're not going to puncture the lung and cause a pneumothorax? And we'll get the same uh, question when we do a subclavicular technique to put a, a central line to subclavian vein. And what I often tell the residents is that if you focus on not causing a pneumothorax, your needle is going to be focused towards that uh, lung tissue and you're going to cause a pneumothorax. On the other hand, if you focus on getting your needle into the vessel, you're going to hit the vessel. Same kind of concept here. Rather than focusing on not moving the bones, I actually think we should be focusing on not causing paralysis of the spinal cord. We should be thinking about what we really care about, which is the spinal cord itself, rather than the bones that support the spinal cord. Part of the reason I believe this is because if you think about normal anatomy, the spinal column itself is a curved structure. It is not flat, and it is designed actually to move. It's designed to articulate. And if our goal is to immobilize and put the patient on the board itself, clearly you're going to distort that normal anatomy. 
And even actually, if our goal is to minimize movement, you're also actually changing normal anatomy because the idea of the spinal column is to move and articulate. And so, yeah, maybe we want to avoid excessive movement as was proposed in the 1940s. But a little bit of movement may not be a bad thing. And again, really what I'm most interested in is the spinal cord rather than the spinal column. Back in the 1800s, we believed that the best way to treat sepsis was bloodletting. We believed that someone who had a really bad infection and was septic, what we needed to do with them is to drain out their blood. And then what we would do is we would drain all that infection out and the, patient, the body would heal itself. George Washington had this really bad pneumonia and he convinced his doctors to bloodlet him. His doctors actually didn't want him to be bloodletted, but he forced them to bloodlet him. And that's how George Washington, our first president, died, was from bloodletting. I would ask my colleagues in the EMS world and the trauma world and the emergency medicine world, how many patients do we have to cause harm to before we actually get it? How many patients do we have to say to ourselves, well, yeah, maybe, huh, before we throw these things away? What will it actually take for us to look at alternate hypotheses besides the hypothesis that was put into literature in the 1970s before we had MRI and before we had EMS medicine? What will it actually take to change this practice that is causing harm to our patients? One of the questions I often get when I lecture on this topic as well, Doc, uh, you know, if I don't put my patient on a board, uh, isn't someone going to sue me? And sure, someone may toss a lawsuit in your direction. But I believe that the best defense legally is to do what we believe is in the right interest of our patient population. I actually have a problem with practicing defensive medicine. Because when I practice defensive medicine, I'm thinking about me. And I shouldn't be thinking about me when I go and take care of my patient. I should be thinking about my patients. And then the me will follow because I do know I did the right thing for my patients. So to me, this is actually not a relevant question because if someone decides to toss a lawsuit in my direction, as Greg Henry would say, then I've just joined the crowd. And that's just the way it is because that's the practice of medicine. We need to do the right thing for our patients as opposed to thinking about what's going to happen if I get sued. That being said, I would say at this point, there's enough in the literature to suggest that the harm of backboards is actually greater than the benefit. And so therefore, I think there actually is legal ground to stand on if you don't put the patient on the backboard. Now we're going to go back to the question of the decubitus ulcers, as I said we would. Uh, I'd like to note that yes, I do actually have uh, hip compliance on this patient. My patient has con consented, uh, and that is in our documentation at Hopkins for me to use this uh, picture in a lecture format only. Um, so this is a patient that I took care of this uh, past summer. He was a 19-year-old male. He was in a motor uh, vehicle crash. Uh, he was a little altered when he came in. Uh, he had a GCS of 14. It was kind of hard to determine if that was because of head injury or the alcohol that was on board. He was not wearing a helmet. He was brought on to the emergency department on a backboard. 19-year-old kid brought on a backboard in Baltimore City. Now, Baltimore City, there's hospitals all over the place. Um, there are four trauma centers inside Baltimore City. Uh, two are at the level, level one trauma center. Um, our hospital is uh, one of those. Uh, and very short transport times. If you look at the transport time of this patient, and then the time the patient was on the backboard in the emergency department, which when I see a patient on the backboard in the emergency department, they are off the backboard like pr pretty instantaneously. Um, so total time on the backboard was less than 30 minutes. And we see the beginning of a decubitus ulcer forming on this patient. In less than 30 minutes time, this patient has a decubitus ulcer in formation in a 19-year-old kid. Now, if you were to think about this in the 70-year-old patient, 
a decubitus ulcer in a 70-year-old patient or a patient with other comorbidities has a real harm to the patient. So this is no joke. This is not something to be laughed at, and this is not something that we can bypass and say, well, you know, as long as we get them off quickly, it's no big deal. They're not going to get a decubitus ulcer. And I will fully admit, this is my anecdotal case of one. I've actually seen other cases of this. This is the third case I've seen, uh, but the only one that I've taken a picture of. Uh, and it's the first one that I saw after I started lecturing on this topic. So I've seen three cases of this, uh, and I'm sure I will see more in the future. Um, we need to stop using backboards. These are causing real harm to our patient, even in a short time that they're on the board. So when we develop practice standards, um, one of the things that is often helpful is when our professional societies step up to the plate and help us in this process. Uh, so with any MSP, uh, we developed a practice standard uh, through the S&P committee. Um, we looked at the literature, and I've shown you much of that literature. Um, this was really spearheaded uh, by Bob Dumeyer, uh and Chelsea White uh, in Michigan. Uh, and I came on to the project uh, to help them uh, as the chair of the committee. Um, it was really their project initially, and I need to give them due credit uh, for the work they did in leading up to this. Um, and so we looked at this and then brought this to our committee. And our committee basically came back uh, with a recommendation to our board of directors uh, to do away with backboards. And what you see published is different than that. Uh, and so the board of NEMSP uh, with ACSCOT came up to a, a different position uh, that I'm going to show you here. Um, and that's just the challenge uh, of developing practice standards. Uh, it has to be passed by the board of directors, and they had a different perspective than our committee had on the direction that we need to take with this. And that's okay, and that, that's just the way it was. Um, but, you know, these are the challenges in developing practice standards. I'm going to talk about practice standards for NMSB ACS, uh, as well as ASEP, and something that was new published by AHA uh, very recently. So the NMSP practice standard uh, says that appropriate patients to be immobilized with a backboard may include those with. And I'll note that I was able to insert the word may into this in that when you read the word may in the English literature, uh, that can also read may not. Um, so patients uh, to be immobilized with the backboard may or may not include those with blunt trauma and altered level of consciousness, spine pain or tenderness, neurological complaints, anatomic deformity of the spine, high energy mechanisms of injury in any of the following, drug or alcohol intoxication, inability to communicate, or distracting injury. And then we write that utilization of backwards for spinal mobilization during transport should be judicious, so the potential benefits outweigh the risks. When this was published, it was basically being published to give some latitude uh, to those who felt strongly that we should be doing away with backwards, and those who felt strongly to, with the idea that we shouldn't and wanted a stronger level of evidence besides what I've shown you to do away with them. Uh, and so that's why there's some latitude brought in here, which gives medical directors the ability to go a couple different directions with it. Now in 2015, ASEP published this statement, uh, which is based off the Nexus criteria in the Canadian C-spine rules, and they write, backboards should not be used as a therapeutic intervention or as a precautionary measure, either inside or outside the hospital, or in for interfacility transfers. And so basically, the ASAP position gets to the idea that the utility of a backboard is to move a patient from point A to point B, in minimizing movement during that process. The purpose of the backboard is not a mobilization. I'm going to go back a slide. You see the NEMSP statement uses the word immobilization patients to be immobilized, whereas the ASEP patient focuses on minimizing movement, which is really more appropriate in terms of what the backboard is actually all about. Now, very interestingly, just this month in October 2015, the AHA resuscitation guidelines were published, and at the end of the resuscitation guidelines, the AHA and the Red Cross uh, created a guideline on first aid. And we read in that guideline, with a growing body of evidence showing more actual harm and no good evidence showing clear benefit, we recommend against the routine application of cervical collars by first aid providers. Now, noting that this statement is about general first aid, 
is not about EMS providers. This is written for the lifeguards, um, those types of people who are doing basic first aid and noting that they should not be putting a cervical collar on because of the harm benefit question uh, in the literature. I find that very interesting uh, that we now have a um, professional society that clearly is talking about benefits and harms and also not just about backboards but about cervical collars themselves. Now when we developed the NAMSP position statement and I had an opportunity to speak with Dr. Hoswald on the phone for about an hour to get his perspective on this topic and in that conversation he mentioned the cervical collar issue. And he felt that at that time, that it actually probably we would go to a time when there would be no cervical collars, and he felt that time should be today. I find that very interesting, and in that it is actually true that the level of evidence showing a benefit of cervical collars is at the same level of evidence showing a benefit of backboards. However, I would counter that the level of evidence showing a harm of cervical collars is not as strong as the level of evidence showing harm of backboards. We do see some evolution in the literature um, that the cervical collars may cause constriction around the carotid arteries and cause decreased blood flow to the brain. But there really is nothing in literature yet that shows that to, to be definitive, um, but that may evolve over time that we show that to be definitive. And so in the future, we may have a clear evidence that we should be doing away with cervical collars entirely as well. So to go to our protocol in the state of Maryland, uh, what I suggested we do is we focus on the spinal cord. And so we created what we call the spinal protection protocol. And to help minimize confusion, we created a definition at the very beginning of the protocol. Spinal protection is defined as act, the act of protecting the spinal cord from further injury, where spinal mobilization is the act of placing a patient on a backboard with cervical collar for the purpose of trying to prevent excessive movement of the spinal column. We've had this protocol in effect now uh, about 10 months, or coming on 11 months. Uh, and interestingly, actually, I saw it used in the emergency department by Baltimore City Fire Department for the first time in my shift last night. Uh, and we know that it does take a while for protocols to actually go into effect, um, and that's just by the nature of it. One of the issues we've had is confusion of, uh, what do you mean, doc, I'm no longer immobilizing, and the, t the terms of trying to focus on the cord itself, while that makes a lot of sense to me as an academic, it doesn't make a lot of sense to some of our providers, and that has introduced confusion that we are trying to figure out how to solve. Our inclusion criteria into the protocol itself is any pain with a patient with minimized spinal pain, tenderness, deformity, a patient with signs or symptoms of neuroparaplegia, quadriplegia, or uh, paresthesias would even enter in this, focal neurological deficits, altered mental status or disorientation, or patients with distracting injuries. Uh, and this was a point of co contention when we were developing this uh, with my surgical colleagues who wanted to make sure we had something in there for distracting injuries. Um, I have a problem personally with distracting injuries because one person's distracting injury is another person's walk in the park. And so it's very subjective what a distracting injury is, yet that is part of our protocol. All patients who enter into that protocol get a cervical collar. Uh, so if they're found with any of those criteria, they're in the spinal protection protocol, they get a cervical collar. Patients who are GCS uh, with 15 and able to safely extricate themselves, able to stand up on their own, get themselves out of a vehicle, can stand up on their own, walk out of the vehicle, and lie down on a soft stretcher of the EMS cart. If the patient has a neurological deficit, then that is not true. So if they're GCS 15, if they're wake and alert, they have no paralysis, they can get up, walk out of the car, lie down on the stretcher. If they're found from a fall, lying on the ground, they can stand up on their own, et cetera. However, with our protocol, if a patient has neurological deficit or if they are altered uh, and can't follow the commands of the EMS provider, then they are to be mobilized. Uh, with a cervical collar and a backboard, and our uh, protocol is written with the word shall be immobilized. 
In our protocols, uh, the pediatric group is very strong, and so we uh, are writing all our protocols for an adult population and a pediatric population. Uh, and so we have a pediatric population protocol as well, uh, which adds more criteria into uh, the group that should be entered into the spinal protection protocol. And this is taken from the PCARN uh, studies that have been uh, work uh, that's been done on this topic. And so from PCARN, we pull out um, what should be in our what's, uh, entry criteria in spinal protection protocol. Interestingly, though, when we developed our protocol, I actually thought the group that would fight us the hardest about getting rid of the backboards would be the pediatric surgeons. And they are actually one of the most supportive groups. Um, they felt these patients should be in cervical collars, but should not necessarily be put onto a backboard. And they were very supportive, uh, which I was very pleased with. However, uh, they did uh, argue that if a pediatric population is in an age where they can't follow the commands of the MS provider and it's difficult to be able to determine if the patient has a neurological deficit or not, that patient again would go into spinal immobilization and shall be immobilized. Now one of the issues we wanted to tackle in developing this protocol was dealing with first responders uh, and specifically looking at athletic trainers. Um, because um, we have uh, a lot of uh, injuries in Maryland that are athletic related. Um, although um, football is not a huge sport for us, lacrosse is, uh, and soccer is a huge sport for us in Maryland, uh, although we do have football as well. And so um, addressing how these patients would be managed uh, when they're put on a backboard by a sports trainer was an important issue for us. And so we wrote was the EMS providers who find a patient on a backboard um, with, that was applied by a sports trainer, um, the protocol still applies. And so if the patient meets the protocol to be able to get them off the board, the EMS providers can get the patient right off the board right there, have them stand up off the board, and then walk to the EMS stretcher. So all the elements of the protocol apply regardless if the patient was put on a backboard by a first responder or not. Now, another element of this that I've taken on uh, is that because of trying to reach out and make sure that the athletic trainer community uh, is wrapped into this process, I've gone to the Maryland Athletic Trainers Conference and talked about this, as well as uh, gone to uh, certain athletic training programs. I gave a lecture at the University of Maryland's football team athletic training program, um, which is Division I football program, um, so that we can try and reach out as many uh, athletic trainers as possible because we want to make sure they are wrapped into what we are doing in the EMS environment. We also address in our protocol helmet removal, and we talked a lot about this with the athletic trainers. Interestingly, we believe the athletic trainers are probably more versed in how to remove a patient's helmet than EMS providers are, uh, and so we encourage the athletic trainers to do that for us, um, yet we want to make sure that if the helmet's removed, um, that the shoulder pads are also removed um, so that um, we do maintain an inline uh, position and don't create uh, excessive uh, extension. But most importantly, we also address in our protocol the issues of hemodynamic support and oxygenation. And we show in um, animal studies that one of the greatest harms uh, to the spinal column itself is hypoxia. We know that any episode of hypoxia causes injury to neurological tissue. And so we really want to minimize episodes of hypoxia, and we want to minimize episodes of hypotension. And so our protocol addresses hemodynamic support and oxygenation and make sure that that is front and center in the minds of the EMS providers. This is important to us because when you focus the movements of the EMS providers on you've got to get this patient on the backboard, it's very easy for them to forget about blood pressure management and about oxygenation. And we want to make sure that that is not forgotten because that probably is what's actually causing injury is hypoxia and hypotension. So when you look at our protocol, what are the strengths? Well, it is scientifically based. We did a full review of the literature. We developed stakeholder consensus, which is very important for our protocols. Maryland has a statewide protocol system with a lot of stakeholders involved. And so this protocol was developed over a two-year period of time with a lot of consensus development. The protocol is not what I would want it to be. 
but it what works for the system today, and that's really important. Because if I threw out a protocol that no one else would buy into, I would get nowhere. And so having consensus is really important. Sometimes you have to give a little to get a lot. Our protocol is very much consistent with the NAMSP statement, but interestingly is not in line with the ASEP statement and may not be in line with what has just been published by AHA. Yet as an opportunity, this position moved the needle for us uh, in that we will see over time dramatically less patients put on a backboard. Again, the first one I saw in my career here was last night. A patient clearly didn't need to be on a backboard and wasn't, and that was a great thing. A challenge with this protocol uh, and with moving forward for us all in the EMS environment nationally is uneducated people. The worst thing that could happen to us in my mind is our EMS providers bring a patient to the emergency department on, not on a backboard and for the EMS providers to then get chastised by some uneducated emergency department staff about this because then the EMS provider would never follow that protocol again. And so we have a responsibility to not just educate our providers, but to also be educating emergency department staff to make sure that they know why we are doing what we are doing so they buy into this as well. And then I also think we have a responsibility to educate the public because the public is expecting that they will be put on a backboard. And we need to make sure they understand when we don't put them on a backboard the reasons why so that they are more compliant and follow through the treatment recommendations that we have for them. So I just want to briefly go back to the harm benefit question. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in that hopefully what I've shown you is that we really don't know if backboards have a benefit. We don't know if movement has anything to do with this. When we have a patient that we put a cervical collar on, we really don't know if that cervical collar is helping the patient or if it's not helping the patient. We don't know if the reason for delayed neurological symptoms and findings is hypoxia, hypotension, swelling, edema. Those are all counter hypotheses that have now been put in the literature. We don't know actually what is causing delayed neurological findings. We don't know if it's because of movement, if it's because of hypoxia, if it's because of hypotension, if it's because of swelling. We don't know. What we do know is that in simulated patients, who are not injured, backboards cause real harm. That we know. And if that real harm is there in a simulated patient, that real harm is there in a real patient. We do know that backboards cause harm. We don't know if they have a benefit. We do know they cause harm. Now, my very good friend, Chuck Cady, who has uh, worked with me for a long time with SMP uh, and uh, is an EMS physician in Milwaukee, he is also passionate about this topic and has lectured on this topic, and I'm stealing this slide from him with his permission. And it, he wrote in his lecture on this topic <clears throat> that when you have something in the practice of medicine where there's no proven benefit and possible risks, and it's unethical to use the procedure. When there's no proven benefit and proven risks, it's criminal to use the procedure. Now I'll tell you in my opinion, I think it'd be kind of strong to say that it's criminal to use backboards for a mobilization, but I would agree that it's unethical. I think it is not the right thing to do. When we cause harm to a patient and we know we are causing harm to the patient and we have no evidence that what we're doing is actually going to help the patient, that is unethical. And in my mind, that's where we are with backboards. It is unethical to be using backboards to immobilize a patient. Now, when we brought our position um, to, from the S&P committee to the NMSP board of directors, and it was rejected by the board of directors for something else, 
I had a good conversation after that meeting with my uh, mentor, uh, Dr. Ritu Sani. And Dr. Sani was uh, one of my faculty when I was a fellow. He is someone who's been a very important friend, uh, an EMS colleague, uh, and someone who I respect very highly in our practice of EMS medicine. And he and I talked about this, and why did the NMSP board make this decision? And what he said is this, in medicine, it requires a higher degree of evidence to remove something from the standard practice than it does to add something to the standard practice. Is this true? Is this right? I've reflected a lot on this uh, for the past few years on this statement. In everything I do in medicine, I reflect a lot on this statement. It creates a needs a stronger level of evidence to remove than to add. And I think that that probably is the way we operate. But I don't know if it's the way we should operate. And that's something that I think is really interesting, not just for the question of backwards, but for everything we do. My career focus, and I really the reason I'm so pleased and honored to be here today talking to you all, I believe that EMS is a practice of medicine. And as every practice in medicine, it should be scientifically based. What we do in EMS medicine should be based on science. And so as we move forward and bring science to the practice of EMS medicine, how we address things I think is really important. Do we need higher degrees of evidence to remove epinephrine from cardiac arrest management than was used to add it in? Those are interesting questions that I think we have to ask ourselves. How much evidence do we need to add and how much evidence do we need to remove? And I don't necessarily know the right answer, but I think it's an important question we in our practice of medicine need to be having. So with spinal cord injury, I think if we really want to protect the cord itself, there probably is utility for backboards for moving a patient from point A to point B. When you find the patient lying in a ditch and you need to get them out of the ditch, a backboard is a tool that can be used to get that patient out of the ditch. Of course, there are other tools you can also use. Backboards are not the only tool to use to move the patient out of the ditch, but it is one tool but should be used for the purposes of extrication and not for immobilization. Lie the patient on the soft stretcher of the EMS cot, that's going to conform to their spinal column better than a backboard. And most importantly, support oxygenation and heat and dynamics. <clears throat> now I've talked to you a lot about science and I've talked to you about, a lot about backboards. And uh, I'm sure that most people who are watching this are probably in line with my thinking, but maybe not everyone. But even you who are watching this who will agree with me, you're going to face people who don't agree. And so this is what I say. Tonight, in the privacy of your own room, in your own home, lie down on your hard kitchen floor. And don't move for 30 minutes. And then ask yourself, is that the right thing to do for my patient? I've lied on a backboard before, and it hurt. And if anyone ever tries to put me on a backboard, I'm going to sue them. Because there's no way in hell you would put me on a backboard. It hurts. I don't think it's the right thing to do for our patients, and I hope you agree. And thank you so much for inviting me, and I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Mike. That was awesome. So just everyone knows, um, that's Mike after an overnight shift. He went worked all night, had a couple hours sleep, and got up to uh, do this for us and uh, did an excellent job. So thank you. Uh, I have one question for you, Mike. Do you know how New York State's making changes to uh, kind of adopt these policies? Do you know how much across the country people are, are moving away from uh, backwards? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to address that question in two ways, or, or two steps. The first is something that we hear a lot uh, and have heard a lot, and this is for the fellows out there who haven't heard it yet, um, which is when you've seen one EMS system, you've seen one EMS system. Uh, and interestingly, that's a statement that I heard when I was a fellow, and I've repeated many times. 
And now as I conceptualize uh, my world of EMS as a practice of medicine, I think it's actually time that we move away from that. I think it's time that when you see one EMS system, you've seen the national country's EMS system. I believe we should all actually be functioning the same way. And what we do in Maryland is what we should be doing in New York and what we should be doing in San Francisco. That's how I believe, because I believe EMS should be about science and not about what some fire chief wants. We are far from there. Uh, and um, it's nothing against the fire chiefs. I'm in the fire service and you see me wearing my work shirt. Um, I've got a great relationship with my fire chief and I love him to death. Um, but nevertheless, I still think it's about the practice of medicine and science and what we do in my fire department should be the same as what's done in the fire department next door. Um, and so it's time we create the practice of EMS medicine and not, hey, this is what I want to do in my system. Now, to move to your question in general, or specifically, um, the one jurisdiction that I know of that um, is really moved the furthest is in Kansas, um, where um, they are really gone all out and are not backboarding anyone. Uh, and um, to my knowledge, they've been successful so far. I believe that they're creating data. I hope they will um, uh, publish that eventually once they have enough outcomes to show us um, no harm uh, and a benefit of not putting the patient on the backboard. Um, the first system that I knew of that did anything with this, I think, was a small jurisdiction in Ohio, and we have that uh, discussed in our paper, uh, Zenia Fire Department in Ohio, small jurisdiction um, that moved this direction. Um, and uh, then you have this seeing in many different places uh, across the country. Um, in Maryland, we are a statewide uh, system, and so our protocol is statewide. Um, but again, the amount that it's adopted is actually jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Uh, and um, so it's slowly coming online, but each jurisdiction's medical director and leadership is going to push it more uh, based on how much they feel it's important. Uh, and um, so even in a statewide system, you see variance of practice. I do know that uh, Dave Cohn uh, has been uh, collecting some data on this and trying to watch uh, with the fellowship directors how much this is uh, taking hold. Uh, and so he could, I think, uh, answer the question a little bit better than I could as to what jurisdictions and what places are doing this. <clears throat> but I do believe that we see this moving across the country. Uh, I think with the ASEP statement about spinal motion restriction, uh, that has given people a little bit more power uh, to move forward. Uh, and now with the AHA saying that first responders shouldn't be putting cervical collars on patients, I think that that will then lead to even more movement. Um, I see a world someday where brad cores are all thrown in the trash. I think we're probably 10 years uh, away from that. And I think we will slowly see movement on this over, over time. You have early adopters and late adopters and most people are in between. Fantastic. I guess anyone else have a question from the group if anyone's left? Three, two, okay, it looks like none. So I just want to thank Mike again. I think that's a fantastic talk. Um, every EMS fellowship should watch that um, as kind of a background to, to their knowledge and to uh, see, you know, modern practice. So I want to thank Mike again. Um, I do want to, just want to say that we do have two talks coming up uh, next month from Mike Daly uh, from Albany uh, doing end of life issues. And then we have Kevin Moonshaw from Mount Sinai doing um, Mobile Integrated Healthcare, uh, his, his practice in doing that. And with that, we'll say thank you and uh, see you next month.